Sunday school teacher sits down, you know, you're getting ready to be taught. You're like, uh-oh, he's quitting already. <laughs> Come on, Charlie. Uh, I, I'm struggling with this whole being nice thing. I'm trying really hard, but it just things come out of me, and uh, uh, I just got to keep working on it. I, I've been accused a couple of times this week. Uh, you know, my New Year's resolution was I'm going to try to be nice, and I'm not going to pick on people, and I'm not going to be sarcastic. But every time I'm nice to people, I get accused of being sarcastic. So it's really a struggle. It's really a hardship for me. You know, I'm like genuinely kind to people, and they're like, oh, thanks a lot. You know, I know you're just making fun of me, being nice. So I don't know. Maybe I was pre-programmed or pre-foreordained. Pre-foreordestinated. That's where we made up, right, Charlie? Just to be mean to people. So I don't know. come on, Charlie. Why don't you teach us? All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you would, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. <coughs> Uh, chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. <coughs> Is your microphone on? Yeah, it looks green. So that should. There it goes. I can hear you now. Okay. I can hear you. Good. Yeah, I guess just starting at verse 1 for, for the context. Okay, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, receiving, or excuse me, receive us, uh, we have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you, great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort, I am exceeding joyful, in all our tribulation. For when we uh, were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Uh, without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us, or comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Uh, those are the same words. Though I repent, or excuse me, though I did repent, for I perceived that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Okay, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, uh, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Okay, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world uh, worketh death. And then he's going to give a description of what that should look like. For behold this self same thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. Okay, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all these things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now this would have been addressing the fact that uh, in the first epistle, actually they were addressed about a number of different issues in 1 Corinthians. Um, and then also of the fact that uh, in 2 Corinthians he's writing to them in particular, well, of the many issues, one of them was the, the gentleman that was in his, uh, he, he was in a relationship, illicit relationship with his father's uh, wife. Uh, so it would, it would have been his stepmom <clears throat> that he was in a, in a, a immoral relationship with. So, um, of, now that's not the only thing that they were guilty of. Uh, they were being partial, they were uh, walking carnally. Uh, in other words, they were following mandate. Some said, I'm of Apollos. I'm a Cephas, I'm of Jesus, uh, I'm of Paul. So there was division there. 
uh, you had uh, the immorality that was going on there. They were taking of the Lord's Supper uh, in, in an improper manner, in particular that they were uh, looking at it as if it were a feast, and then they were not regarding it for, the, for what it was as a memorial uh, of what Jesus had done for us, and that he gave his body, he gave his life for us, and that it was supposed to be uh, somber. It's a remembrance of the fact that he paid for our sin. And that uh, it's not, though it's a grand thing, it's a, something to rejoice and something to celebrate. The fact is that the payment for sin uh, itself is, wow, and that's sobering. And, and they also would have taken it in, in a proper manner in that they had sin in their life. So they weren't judging themselves. They were uh, taking it lightly, not just because of the party aspect of it, uh, of which they were approaching it, but also the fact that uh, the, the personal sin that they would have had wasn't something that they regarded. But also the fact that they were misusing, if we look at 12, 13, 14, in particular as far as the gifts that they, uh, in particular they wanted to be uh, expressive in the gift of tongues and a few of the others. So some of those gifts, what they were doing is they were misusing. Uh, and there was a disorder that was, a uh, confusion that was there. Um, there was a number of different issues. Um, anyway, so of what he had addressed to them, uh, in particular, he addresses here the fact that the gentleman that had uh, been in that immoral relationship, they finally um, dealt with, but they were not wanting to, I guess, restore him. So Paul's attitude uh, was, well, the goal of the church discipline would have been for restoration. He wants them to be restored, uh, so it's fine to go ahead and restore him if he's repented. And then <laughs> of the other things that were mentioned as well, their attitude with regard to um, what they were doing before and what he had addressed of them uh, had changed, and that's something that he was now commending him on over here. And he was comforted in, in the fact that Okay, now there's a difference, and this, this is what it, how it looked, and this is what it played out. Um, okay, just so you know, we are starting. Excuse me, we're starting a series on uh, the subject of repentance. Uh, well, actually, excuse me, words in context. Particularly this week, we're looking at the word repentance. We are going to look at a few other passages in particular that deal with the word um, and how it's used. But so we, uh, this is one that's really clear. And uh, for some reason, it seems to be like an argument uh, hmm. this day and age yeah. uh, as to, I, I don't know, it's just pretty clear in scripture. If you just read through scripture, it's like pretty simple. But for some reason, it seems to be an argument uh, this day and age, uh, <coughs> theologically. All right, so the word repent, it's could used. You, could you elaborate on that a little bit, give the specifics? Because I, th I think what you mean to say is, uh, particularly in the area of, of the gospel, like a lot of guys will say that they'll take they'll they'll argue about you know do you preach repentance when you share the gospel? Do you, is that part of the of sharing the gospel? And then other guys will say, well, no, you know, repentance. And could you elaborate on the specifics of that? Because I think that's kind of key, don't you think? To are you going there later? No, yeah, I can do that now. That's fine. Okay. All right, I just, <laughs> just tell us what people, what, what. Okay, I was, well. Where people are coming from, that's kind of. I was getting to find a word. <laughs> okay, there you go, go ahead. Yeah, I just, all right. Um, you got two words that are used in the Old Testament. Uh, you have 110 references to the word repent, or a variation of it. Uh, you have, in scripture, found uh, repent, repentance, repented, repentance. Uh, repenteth and repenting. Uh, 46 for the word repent, just the word repent itself. Repentance, 26 um, verses using that. Repented, 32. Repentance is one. You have repenteth, there's five. And then repenting, you have one. Um, now, now, all that comes up to about 110. Um, in the Old Testament, you only have, well, excuse me, you have three instances 
for a, there's two words that are used. One of them is uh, nacham, which is depending on how it's used, basically it means to be sorrow, sorrowful, uh, to con or it could be used to console, but it, repent, regret, uh, have compassion, um, and that's the primary word that's used whenever you see it in the Old Testament. You only have about three instances. There's a secondary word called shub. Uh, and that's used in 1 Kings 8, 47, and then two uh, verses in Ezekiel, uh, 14, 6, and then 18, 30. And that's literally just to turn or to return, to turn again. Uh, that's the primary words that are used uh, in Hebrew, uh, so in the Old Testament. So you're saying there's four of those instances of the shuv? shuv? No, three. Three, wow. Yeah. Uh, Isn't that primarily how repentance is defined, though? To turn or return? Mm -hmm. Usually, when it's, when we, when it's defined, yes, Prime, well, so depending on some people, of it. yeah, but there is there is a sorrow, <laughs> like metanoia, yeah. Not, yeah. Actually, there's <laughs> that's the primary word in in, in, the Greek, in the Greek. There is a second word that actually has two words, but one is a uh, got the alpha primitive on it, so whatever. It's <coughs> you have two words that are used in the New Testament, uh, metanoia, which basically means to like change your mind. It's a compound word. Meta. Meta being nice. alongside and then noose would be your mind. And then you have um, meta melatos, which has to do with like a regret, like a sorrow, sorrowing. Um, and that's used primarily in the negative. Uh, and that's in Second Corinthians, which we see here in this passage. And then also in uh, Romans eleven twenty nine where it talks about that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So in other words, he doesn't, there's no, there's not a regret. Uh, mm -hmm. When, in, in that passage, as far as the 11, uh, Hebrew, Hebrews, I keep wanting to say Hebrews, uh, but it's Romans, when he talks about the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, that's, okay, God doesn't, he doesn't, he's not changing his mind, he's not regretting, he's not sorrowful, mm -hmm. but the fact that, okay, he gives a gift or a calling. Uh, but the two main words that you would have, and actually, of those of the New Testament instances where we see repent or repentance used is going to be metanoia, which is a changing of the mind. Now, um, in this passage, okay, wait a minute. To address your question or your statement, I guess you'd say you wanted me to elaborate on uh, how people use it or misuse repentance with regard to salvation. <coughs> All right. Yeah. Um, I guess the argument is put forth that to preach the gospel from well, okay. Here, here's here's just as an observation. It, correct me if I'm wrong, or if if I'm not elaborating to what you want me. To, um, uh, I've, I've I've personally done this. Um, you go, you preach the gospel, and the gospel is pretty clear. Uh, that is, in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, Christ died according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. Or in John 3, you know, uh, not just that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's, you know, John 1, 12 again, that as many as received them to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's the placing of your trust on Jesus uh, to do what you can't do for yourself, and that is to pay for your sin. Okay? Jesus died to pay for sin. He didn't just stay dead. He rose again from the dead three days later to be able to give new life. And so my sin debt, or not just mine, but anybody, anybody that has sinned to anybody that is in bondage to sin is incapable of being able to please God in his righteousness with their own ability, right? There's nothing, you know, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, is what scripture says in Galatians in particular. Uh, you cannot please God and his righteousness by being a good person, by going to church or any of those things. So what you need to do is you need to trust Christ uh, in order to do that. And that's, you do that by receiving him. Now, there's a contention of some people in particular because uh, a ph phenomenon that you would see. Uh, you have people that 
um, either one, they, they cry out to God, they, they, they pray to God, you know, Lord, save me. And it seems like their lifestyle doesn't change much. Yeah. Um, or you run into people that maybe you are uh, door to door and then you ask them, you know, have you ever received Christ as your savior? Yes. I guess the question is, is, that, is, is repentance necessary for salvation? And some, some say yes, some say no. He does state it clearly in, <laughs> in Matthew. I guess it is necessary. So it's a, yeah. The, I guess what is meant by it is the thing some people yeah, argue. Yeah, that's why you have to define it in context. That's the whole right. point. You have to define yeah. what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the context of salvation, you know, what people are saying is repentance totally ignores all the primary context of salvation. And then all the teaching about repentance in other contexts is completely put into salvation. So, <clears throat> when the, for instance, in Romans, when the Bible is talking about repentance for Israel, everybody's talking about that as part of the doctrine of soteriology, you know, which is really confusing when you go to define repentance. Okay. Um, so, the argument is that you have. <coughs> Folks, that for some reason it seems like they're not living right. They're, you know, you. Well, I've had this happen to me when I was in Shelby. Um, I come to the door, the guys smoking a pipe, and then or chewing tobacco, or you know, he's got a beer with him, and then uh, you know, he's obviously somewhat got a buzz on him, and then you know, I ask him, "Hey, have you ever trusted Jesus as your savior?" And a lot of times they'll say, "Yeah." Uh, most people say, yeah. Now, the thing is, I can't look on a person's heart. Uh, so only he knows and God knows. But the fact is, and then they would say, okay, yeah, I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. Or they'll go through and then they'll be like, yeah, I've already done that. Or I've already done, yeah, praise the Lord, I'm washing his blood. I've, you know, been baptized. You know, I'm a member of such and such church or whatever. And then it's like, if you have that, okay. It seems like a cognitive dissonance, uh, dissonance, <laughs> where like, wait a minute, if you're saved, then how can you be living like that? Yeah. Or if you're saved, how is it that it seems like there's no apparent conviction of the fact that, you know, these, these things are in your life? Or that, you know, it's like there's, there seems no, to be no apparent shame. That seems to be the case with this person in Corinthians we're talking about. Hmm. Right. Which? The person that the the... the, the you did this, the passage that you read was about the guy who had, it, who, was, who, was, who had his father's wife or him, that guy? Um, he's speaking overall to the church, the Corinthian church. Uh, he was encouraged by them because of the fact that they, here's how he puts it because it seems almost confusing, but he says here, um, He was saved, though, right? Even in the midst of all that? Sure looks like yeah. it. Yeah. The, yeah, you'd have to conclude that just because of what he, how he speaks to him and how he yeah. states it. Um, he says, And not only by his coming, and, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told of, of your earnest desire and your mourning and your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoice the more. Okay, so they had a fervent mind towards... Paul, uh, they had an earnest desire, and then um, there was a mourning. Now that would be in reference to, all those would be in reference to the fact of what it had been previously addressed, which was, he had chastised them, mm -hmm. in particular of the fact that, okay, they weren't sorrowful over the fact that they weren't doing anything about this guy. Um, now he addresses earlier in the book that take him in. Uh, lest he should be overtaken with sorrow and then Satan have an advantage. In other words, see, the person obviously had repented uh, of his sin, and so it was okay to go ahead and receive him back. Um, and so he's addressing that now. It's like, okay, you can't just kick him out. If he's a brother, he's a brother. God's purpose in uh, judgment or God's purpose in... Um, church discipline would have been restoration. He wanted them to restore. 
Um, mm. He was given up for the destruction of the flesh. He <laughs> repented. <laughs> and so now God sees, okay, hey, he's repented. He, he's to be restored. But their overall mindset and attitude towards what had been addressed them, not just about that issue, but also about the others, was they had a mourning, they had an earnest desire, and they had a fervency, a fervent mind towards him. And then their responses, this is how it plays out. Um, there was a sorrowing, but they sorrowed after a godly manner. And the godly manner is exhibited in that there was a uh, carefulness, there was a clearing, there was an indignation, and then there was a fear and a vehement desire, and then there was a revenging. Okay? So, that's, in other words, the outworking of a change in mind towards something. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Alright. So, in this case, the sins that they were guilty of, their change of mind produced a uh, vehement desire, a zeal, a revenging, a carefulness, and then a clearing. All right, so they went ahead, and this is their attitude now. You look at it like this. It'd be saying uh, as if the quote, well, some of the RU principles, okay? God <coughs> against it, so am I. In other words, what you do is you, whatever you would hold as your mindset and your attitude is, this is wicked. God says it wicked. So I reject that, and now I have to adopt God's mind towards whatever he says this issue is. Does it make sense? Okay. That, and then the product of that is going to be seen played out by, obviously, by the behavior. Uh, you can see it, <laughs> you see it most clearly in, well, uh, I'll be honest with you, you see it most clearly with regard to the issue of like divorce and remarriage, okay? <laughs> this, that's the most clearest thing that you see it with as far as somebody, whether or not they would have repented or they have, uh, as far as just an instance. And I say that because of this. It's like, okay, you have uh, Christians that want to argue, you know, God gives the exclusion clause, you know, uh, but save you. Exception. The exception clause. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he gives the exception clause. He says, except for, or save for the cause of fornication, you know, that you can divorce, right? And then we know his attitude towards it. He says, when the Pharisees and the scribes were addressing him on that issue, he says, they address him saying, you know, Moses gave a writing of divorcement. And what was his response? His response was, it was not so from the beginning. You know, you know, God made uh, husband, basically, yeah. a husband and wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. What God had put together, let no man put asunder. And then he goes and he does give exception clause, and then here's what he says, that anyone that would take a woman that is put away committeth adultery. So... Now, I'm going to argue from a point, just so you know, I'm not trying to advocate it, but I'm going to argue from a point of, like, devil's advocate, if you wanted to go ahead and say, uh, well, he does say there specifically that it's saved for the, for, saved for the cause of fornication, right? So if you wanted to argue that and, like, okay, concede that. He doesn't give uh, clearance for somebody to be able to go ahead and, and here's where a lot of people will go to 1 Corinthians um, 7. Seven to go ahead and want to argue that okay, somebody you're freed, uh, so you are no longer under bondage, and so you're now free to be able to go ahead and do whatever you want. Okay, I'm not arguing for that, I'm not advocating that, I'm just simply stating that's what a lot of people would argue. Um, but here's the thing um, you're excluded at that point. Well, one, it's sin, <coughs> God considers it sin, and I can't argue the fact that He says. Uh, not that I would want it, but simply, you know, if you marry somebody that's put away, you can't, you know, that that's committing adultery. Uh, and then two, a lot of times it's 
folks that um, either they may have been ignorant of it or whatnot, uh, they get saved and then you don't usually, usually a lot of those folks are usually stand up and staunchly agree with you. Um, but you'll see sometimes where, okay, somebody feels for some reason uh, they're called to, you know, want to be in the pastorate. Uh, and scripture is pretty clear as far as the, the qualifications for a pastor for a deacon. Uh, it's going to be a husband and one wife. Okay, at that point, the worst individual is not going to be that. So uh, they would want to argue that. Or if you have somebody that maybe is in church or whatever, their marriage isn't going that great, so they want to go ahead and get divorced and get find you know whoever else that they have already been in a relationship with, uh, and then try and excuse it and write it off as saying, okay, see, God gives gives me uh, the the right or the leeway to be able to go ahead and do this. Um, that's why I say you see this most clearly in that. All right, if you're going to have been somebody that would have repented of that, then you wouldn't hold such a light, frivolous attitude towards marriage to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, you would be agreeing with God. If you would have been somebody that either had been guilty of it prior, uh, either because of your rebellion or just simple ignorance, be it before you got saved or after you got saved, if you would have repented of that, then you would hold God's attitude towards it, uh, which is, if you were guilty of it, hey, I was guilty. If you sought actual cleansing from God, which we see in 1 John 1, 9, which is you confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You ask God for cleansing, he's going to give it to you. Now, in that matter, that's a little bit more complicated. You ask, okay, what would you do? How do you repent of that? How would you repent? <laughs> How would the clearing of yourself of that take place? Say the whole thing again, because you keep asking how would you repent of that. But oh, the, the divorce. You're divorced and remarried. Okay. There would be a clearing that would take place. Well, how is that accomplished? Usually? First of all, there's a reconciliation that cannot be fully reconciled that a repentance would have to do with getting right with your first spouse yeah. for anything that you're wrong about. You know, um, of course, remarriage really confuses, makes that a mess. You know, it adds a twist to it. It makes getting right impossible. The Bible law actually forbids going back to a spouse after you've been remarried or put them away. Um, then then it has to do with just saying to God, God, I'm wrong. You know, I repent. I'm asking you to forgive me. And then really seeking, you know, the question of how do I get right. Yeah. All right, here's something I just want to add to that. The mentality towards the sin itself is going to be different. Sorry. There's mentality towards... <laughs> the actual, not just what he did, but just the overall, the act. In other words, you're not going to be advocating or uh, saying, hey, this is okay. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be somebody that, and again, you don't have to go ahead and be parading around, walk around with like a... Uh, Chip on your shoulder, bud. Yeah. The fact is, yeah. I, you know, I did wrong. I sinned. If you're addressed about it, you're asked about it, uh, if it comes up, I was wrong. <laughs> this is what God has to say about it. You know, I've been yes. Yeah. Do you think the person should need to address it with other people that they've influenced because of the decision that they made? That would depend on the situation. Well, what he's talking about, I've seen, is people that are in that sin become advocates for the sin. In other words, they push it. <laughs> Uh, um, I, there, there are preachers that write books, you know, tr explaining how this is the right decision and this is why it's okay. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, in the church, anytime there's somebody that's thinking about divorce, people that have been divorced and remarried, not people that are divorced, people that are divorced and aren't remarried usually are like, man, work out your relationship.
It's terrible to be alone. But people that are divorced and remarried are like, hey, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Just, you know, kick that spouse to the curb and God will give you another one. You know, I mean, they literally push. They push for people to go through divorce. You know, they encourage divorce because it's just, it's a, they're not repenting about it. They don't see it as adultery uh, when they're remarried. So they literally become proponents of it and undermine uh, other people's faith. They actually, you know, so I think that's what he's saying. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. And you've affected other people, like so. Then if, if that's you become repentant about it, and you've encouraged someone else to go for it, boy, what a terrible thing! It's like a person that does drugs and hooks their little brother or sister on drugs, and then their brother or sister is OD'd and killed. Like it's a pretty terrible thing, you know? Yeah. You lead someone else to sin. Instance like that, I would say, yeah. Um. I would say would that be part of repentance, or would that just be something good that they should do? I don't know. I, it matters, but well, it, again, it depends on the situation. Because the thing is, a lot of times people don't commit things with the okay, awareness so, of what so they've in affected. In a situation where you've ad, they've advocated, if they're advocating, then yeah, that would else. that's not okay. If they're advocating, then yeah. They would have to basically publicly retract. It'd be like somebody, um, mm -hmm. well, not just any public figure, but I mean, just anybody that, okay, you put forth, this is what I taught, this is what I believed. Hey, I'm wrong. This is what God says, and this is what I have to adhere to now. You know, if I'm going to be right with God, if I'm going to continue being right with God, because this is this is what God teaches. You know, I I denounce everything that I would have been about before. That, that would be a, a repentant attitude. That would be something that would have been okay because they seek a clearing, uh, but there's a revenging. And there's, there's, there's a behemoth desire. There's something there that says this is wrong, this is wicked. It, I, know? I agree. It, it's there's, like Zacchaeus going back and restoring to those that he defrauded. That's a good illustration. Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, you, don't, you don't have <laughs> a lightness or a flippancy to, uh, to, to, to the sin. Um, you don't become a victim. I, there are some Christians who are like, "Okay, so leave me alone about it." You know, I'm sorry. Okay, you know, like, like it's actually a. He actually addresses that here. Yeah, yeah. this is he because he talks about sorrow of the world and then sor godly sorrow. Okay, sorrow of the world uh, is going to lead you to death. There's a sorrow and. Though you may be regretting what you've done, uh, the fact is, with God there's hope. See, the difference is God brings judgment. And He wants to give life. He wants to restore. He wants to save. Uh, he's not looking to destroy. Um, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. <coughs> and the fact is, if He wants to take you out, He can and He will. Does it make sense? In other words, if you're not going to if you're going to be so staunch and stubborn, uh, uh, so stiff-necked that you don't want to turn, you know, you're not going to leave him much of a choice but to have to just cut you off. Uh, but he's giving you space so that you would turn to him, uh, so that you would reject your path and go on his path. Uh, and his, um, the, the godly sorrow, uh, he talks about, Work with, uh, repentance to salvation not to be repented of. In other words, there's a rescuing. There's um, salvation here being not salvation of being rescued from going to hell, but in other words, being rescued from following in, continuing in sin. In other words, you're not, you're not going to be destroyed. Sin leads to death regardless. Does it make sense? Like sin, uh, wages of sin is death in what we read about in Romans. Uh, not just going to hell, but in other words, sin, sin, all its outworkings are going to lead to death. Uh, sin will kill you. Sin will destroy you. Um, by the way, that was written to believers. Uh, the wages of sin is death. And that was in context of uh, getting spiritual victory. Uh, reckoning yourselves being dead and deed unto sin, but alive unto Christ. That we wouldn't follow 
In other words, we wouldn't continue in sin, that grace may abound, but rather that we would yield ourselves unto God and that we would reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin so that we would have victory. So in other words, sin is not our slave master. And reason being is that sin, uh, as appealing as it might be to our flesh and all, uh, has no, there's no outworking to it. There's no product to it. There's nothing to it. There's nothing beneficial. All it has is death for you. Uh, but God's gift is eternal life. And God's gift is life. In other words, we have life because of Christ. And not just going to heaven, but we have life now. We have life abundant now available to us if we yield and we don't 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 give way to uh, sin. He's freed us from it, so we don't have to obey it. We don't have to obey the lusts and the desires that come to us be it by means of the devil or the world or our flesh. Uh, anyways, okay repenting here, the outworking of it is going to be you're going to have a sorrow for, okay, not only, yeah, I've committed my sin, and the sorrow for, for the fact that, hey, look, I've ruined possibly lives by means of how I've affected them, but also the fact, more importantly, is that I've put a barrier between me and God here as far as my relationship, so I'm not going to be able to continue, you know, walking in His light. And so, um... I sorrow for these things, but there's big, a, there's a working out, and the working out is you have um, the obviously the carefulness. All right, so now I am walking circumspectly. I'm looking to see the root out what is in you know my life that is influencing or allowing uh, for this sin to remain or these sins to remain. Uh, I'm looking to to get them out. Uh, you have the clearing. All right. Declaring, or basically, I'm looking to have restored relationship or what I've damaged to be restored. So I'm going to go ahead and seek to get right. Uh, you have um, the indignation, and then fear, and vehement desire, and then a revenge. Yea, what zeal, and then what revenge. <coughs> so these are all attitudes that I would maintain and a mindset that I would maintain with regard to sin, in particular my sin. I'm sorry, did you have your hand up? Could you turn the volume up a little? Okay, I'm sorry, I'll speak. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that better? Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, oh, go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We'll start in verse 1 just for the context, but we'll be reading down to basically kind of like verse 10 to verse 13. Uh, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Okay, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Uh, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? Okay, now mind you, this argument here is that he's now addressing the church at Rome about the fact that Israel, he, he, he kind of veers off a little bit and he's speaking, well, he's been addressing Israel and God's plan for Israel in chapter 9. We're in Romans chapter 10. I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 10. And then he it says some pretty interesting things here. He says that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, which is interesting considering that Israel is who? What do you mean? 
they're, they're God's, God's people. chosen people. Yeah, yeah, they're God's chosen people, <coughs> and they are as we well. Okay, this is two big questions. I'm sorry. They are at the beginning of the scripture. At the beginning of this book, told that they were the ones that were committed the oracles of God. Okay, so no other nation has had the laws that they have had. No other nation has had God in their midst. No other nation has had God's word committed unto them. You know, they were the ones that were supposed to be the preservers of God's word. Okay, so no, basically no other nation has had the exposure to God Almighty as Israel has had uh, as a privilege. So them being ignorant uh, is kind of interesting. That's a willful ignorance uh, or a deliberate misleading by those that would be in charge. Um, but they are zealous, though. It says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Okay, now he's addressing about the fact that, okay, they want salvation or they seek a salvation, but the fact is they do it by going about and establishing their own righteousness, being self-righteous, which is, okay, they take God's law, and okay, we're going to keep it. And you get uh, basically cleansing from God, and you get uh, righteousness before God by keeping the law, which he, he addresses there. He says that that's foolish, because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So in other words, it's not keeping the law that gets you saved, but rather it is faith in Christ alone, because by no, you know, um, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, and it's, it's just not possible. Otherwise, Christ died in vain. Okay, then, um, and then he, he, he brings forth his argument, and here is what um, the righteousness of faith says. And starting in verse 8, it says, But what saith it? This is speaking of the righteousness of faith now. The righteousness which comes basically by faith. It says, um, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. Uh, okay, that is the word of faith which we preach. And here's the word of faith that they preach. This is verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath risen from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Uh, verse 10, hi, good morning. Uh, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Alright, so in other words, believing a few things here in particular is how you're redeemed. Okay, it's by faith, and it's not by working or keeping the law. Um... He says here, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Quick question, what does that mean? What does it mean that you're confessing the Lord Jesus? Acknowledging him as God and Savior. Alright, here's an interesting study. Everything about Jesus. Alright. <clears throat> Grammatical structure, you can say that Jesus is the Lord. Now, this is going to seem kind of like a silly thing, but the word itself, it's curios, it's master. There's only two words that you would use or you would find uh, in your New Testament, and primarily just one of them is used uh, with, re with reference just to Lord. And Lord can mean either like a master or a ruler, like a governor. Or is speaking of, of God the Lord. In your Old Testament, you have three primary words that are used as far as for expressing, okay, who God is. But primarily you have as far as Jehovah or Yahweh being the, the Lord. You know, in other words, that's, that's, this, this is God Almighty as opposed to where he's called Adonai, which would be, he's, you know, the same idea, concept of Kyrios, which is a master or ruler. So a lot of times what people take is they'll take, because it just says curios there, okay, so he has to be uh, ruler, master, lord of your life. You have to acknowledge him as lord of your life. Uh, otherwise, you're not, um, if you're acknowledging him as God, then that's kind of understood. Okay, he's God, he's master and ruler of everything. 
here's the idea in other words you're acknowledging the fact that Jesus is deity Jesus is God Almighty Jesus is Jehovah Jesus is the one that created the world Jesus is uh, he's, he's literally God and so when you're believing the fact okay Jesus wow this is God died for me he didn't just die but he rose again from the dead um, I trust I put my 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 comp my trust in that um, not just okay you know, those facts but the fact is of what he did for me which was he paid for my sin he's my sin payment and he just stayed dead he rose again from the dead three days later so that I would have new life boom I have an exchange at that point I'm committing my soul to him Lord save me I call out to him as it says here whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord which we just stopped a little short of uh, that if you know you believe in your heart uh, God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He rescues you. Okay. Now it seems kind of silly, but why would you be calling out for him to rescue you? <laughs> it's because you need rescue, because you acknowledge the fact that, hey, look, my sin before God has a death penalty, and I'm going to hell, and I can't do anything about it, so I need to trust Christ. Okay. So that I'm coming to God, I'm coming to Christ to save me of my sin, because my sin is taking me to hell, and I need to I need, I need I need to be rescued. God save me. All right. Now, how does that look? That's repentance for uh, salvation. And what would be the outworking or looking of that? In other words, what how, what would you look for as a evidence? I mean, obviously, okay, well, a lot of people the, would look the prayer, for prayer, or the, the the asking, the the acknowledging that Jesus is Lord. What do they? Yeah. What do they think about God? What do you think about Jesus? Or is this Jesus God? <clears throat> I mean, obviously, yeah, you would want to look as far as, okay, the sin and all that, but the fact is a, a person can change their behavior, uh, but that doesn't mean that they were born again. Okay? A person, a person that's born again is because they've trusted Jesus. You know? Behavior change is nice and good and all, but the fact is, that doesn't save me. Okay, behavior modification is not what Christ came to do. Though, that will be an outworking of our yielding to him and to his spirit when he wants it in, in, in the sanctification process. But the fact is, uh, what I believe about Christ, what I believe about Jesus, is, is what saves me. And a person that's called out to him because of fact that hey they're sin debt they can't pay for it they need him to pay for it if they've done that if they've received Christ then that they're born again uh, if they are living in sin then they need to be challenged about the fact that you need to walk you need to repent of that and you need to you need to walk you need to walk in victory uh, you can't maintain a relationship with God and still continue in sin you know, and that's you're too far out of time. You got quit. All right, that's too <laughs> too much. Um, all right, uh, I'm out of time for questions. I'm sorry. If you have any questions about anything, just write them down or approach me. Also, next week we're going to be looking at uh, grace. Uh, we'll be looking at a few others. Uh, in particular, I wanted to look at um, which he mentioned this morning. As far as like <coughs> predestination and, and all that, all that stuff, all that kind of fun stuff that a lot of what the Bible has to say about it. Um, if you again, if you have anything Wait. that you would want to stop, <laughs> uh, be covered, then uh, just go ahead and let me know. Uh, we're dismissed. Thanks. <laughs> I was like ten minutes stop. <laughs> That's why I need